Hi, thanks for joining us online. We're always so grateful for the opportunity to connect with you, whether you're a regular here at LBCC, or maybe you're a fellow follower of Jesus Christ, or someone looking to learn more about Jesus and Christianity in general. Well, as a church, our aim is simple. First, we want to connect you to Jesus. He is the God who is the source of all life and goodness. And when you're connected to him, your whole life will change. And when you connect to him, you'll find that he wants to connect you to others, which is our goal too. You see, community is God's idea. We didn't come up with it. It's right there from the beginning of the story of scripture. Secondly, we wanna help you grow. Grow as a whole person. Uh, we want you to grow in your faith, obviously, and have a dynamic relationship with, with God through Jesus. But we want to see you grow in every aspect of your life. And part of that growth is when you join others on the journey of faith. There's something that happens when we work together, play together, and do things together that causes us to grow in relationship. And finally, we want to help you find ways to invest your life to be part of something bigger than yourself. You see, we were never meant to have life just be about us. It's really about learning to find a way to be part of something where you can impact the lives of others, whether it's your family at home, the people you work with in your neighborhood, your town or your city. We really want to see you get invested and impact your world. Now we hope you'll be encouraged by today's sermon, but first there's some information coming up here on upcoming events. Please look around our website, check out our YouTube channel, and hopefully we'll get to meet you sometime soon in person. God bless you, and may God's best be for you. Our Sunday service is back in person at 9.30 a.m. Masks are not required, but are encouraged for those who are unvaccinated. We also invite you to join one of our other events as an encouragement on your journey to connect, grow, and invest at LBCC. We host breakfasts for women and men on the second and fourth Saturday mornings. You can sign up at lbcovenant.org slash welcome slash upcoming dash events. Check out our life groups, a great way to meet and get to know us better. Some of them meet in person, some on Zoom. There are a couple times a month. And of course, visit our website or call the office at 732 732- 870-2028 to get info or ask for prayer. We'd love to help you in any way we are able. Now, here's today's sermon. It's good to worship together. It's good to praise God together. It's good to be reminded of God's goodness. It's good to be reminded that He has already won, that our hope isn't here, our hope is in eternity. Well, this morning I want to continue um, as we begin to wrap up this series on um, First Thessalonians. I was going to do the whole rest of the uh, uh, chapter 5 today, and, and the more I looked at it, I said, well, that's, that'll be cramming an awful lot in. So I'm going to be, uh, look at a, a few verses today, and then we'll spend a couple more weeks uh, seeing how Paul closes this letter. Now, basically, Paul begins his closing with a series of exhortations. Actually, if you count them, it's like 13 different exhortations, and then a prayer for them, and he asks for prayer for himself. So let's look at uh, these couple of verses, beginning in uh, verse 12 of chapter 5, and uh, consider some of these, what he's saying to the church there, and obviously its impact on our lives. So it says, but we ask you, brothers and sisters, to recognize those who diligently labor among you and are in leadership over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you regard them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that um, we, would, um, we would be able to glean from what Paul wrote to the, the Thessalonians, uh, how we can apply this to our lives, Lord. We would see his heart for the church, his exhortation to the brothers and sisters there, and here at 
through, these, uh, through the corridors of time into our lives today, Lord. While we are in many ways so different from that church, Lord, in many ways we, we are so the same. So we ask that you'd help us, help me, Lord, help us to, uh, to grasp and apprehend the truths and the exhortations given here uh, for our own lives as it impacted them also, in Jesus' name. So these verses I read you are, could be seemingly different. It's, there's an exhortation to the church about their leadership, and then there's an exhortation to the church in general. And oftentimes when we look at the scripture and we look at things, we, when we see something about leaders, we take it and we put it over here, as if it's the church and the leaders, but it's not. And I think it's great that right in the middle of this passage, there's a linking sentence, and it says this, live in peace with one another. You see, what Paul's writing here isn't to the leaders or just about the leaders, it's to the church. In fact, when we think about leadership, when we think about the church, we have to think of it as one thing. It's not them and us or us and them or anything like that. In fact, I'm calling this sermon, This Is Us. Because every church has leaders and members and a family going somewhere together. Just like in your natural family, you have a mother and a father and children, and, and it's not them and us, even though sometimes between the teenagers and the parents, it seems like that. But it's us. This is us. This is where we're going together. And as a family, we're, we're looking to journey as, as, a, as a natural family and obviously as a spiritual family. We're called on a journey toward Jesus together. This is addressed to the whole church. And when perhaps the best way to think of this is when we address the, the topic of, of spiritual leadership, we do it in the context of the spiritual family. It's together. It's, a, it's not like the, the leaders run a business and you're the customers. It's, it's nothing like that. It's much more like a family. And leaders are given, pastors, are, pastors and pastoral leaders are given in many ways uh, responsibilities that fathers are given to oversee, to protect, to guide. And all parents should do that in many ways. And if you, if you think I'm just making this up, <clears throat> listen to me, 19 times in this short letter, Paul uses family terms, brothers and sisters, brethren, whichever way you want to interpret it uh, or translate it. Uh, he talks about being a, a, a father to them, a mother to them. 19 times, he it. in fact, he says it so many times, you think, ease up, Paul, you know, you know, you ran out of words to use here or something? But he's trying to, he's saying all of this in a family context, and we need to see it that way. Now, honestly, I would probably be more comfortable uh, talking about leadership in another church. See, if I was preaching it, in fact, I was talking to Pastor Chris on Friday from Searchlight, and I was telling him what I was going to talk about this morning. I say, you know, it, I'd be very comfortable coming to your church and telling them how they ought to treat you. You know, and I'm not here today to tell you how to treat me. I'm here for us to look together at some truths about leadership here. There's four thoughts in what he says about leadership. The first is this. He tells them to recognize those who are in leadership. Now, that word recognize can go, it's translated in some places as respect or honor or uh, acknowledge them. Be aware of them. I'd say it this way. What we ought to realize is that we need to value our leaders. All of us do. You know? How many times as a parent uh, would you feel like your kids don't appreciate all you do for them, right? And what, what, we, what you'll tell somebody, like a lot of times uh, uh, many of us have had the opportunity to encourage other people's kids, especially their teenagers, right? When When... You know, mom and dad just don't understand anything. And what, what we usually do is we try to get them to appreciate their parents, to appreciate how much their parents love them. And yes, you don't understand why they're expecting this from you or, 
why that or uh, you know why they do this or don't do that the way you'd like them to. But we're always telling them appreciate your parents, value them, and and they they in most cases do come around. We need to be aware of the work. We need to understand that every family has parents and every church has leaders, and they're part of who we are. And we need to appreciate them. We need to recognize them. Give them the, uh, later he says, esteem them in love. And we'll talk about that in a second. So we're supposed to recognize them. You know? And I think, I think whenever we talk about leadership, we have to, we have to realize we have pre preconceived ideas or perhaps from our past experiences in leadership. It's like somebody... Somebody who has a terrible relationship with their earthly father is more likely to kind of recoil at the idea of God being their father, right? And somebody who, who has been wronged by leadership is, of course, more likely to not trust leadership. But we have to understand that the world has always had leaders and needs leaders, and part of our problem is that in our culture, it's like we know every flaw leaders have because they're on television, radio, internet, and everything. Every dumb thing they say. That's why I stay away from microphones whenever I can. It's like, so the dumb things I say don't get recorded. I was, this is an aside, but it fits in. I was reading a, a, a comment a friend of mine made, a younger, younger, uh, a younger man, made um, talking about the hearings for the, uh, for the Supreme Court justice. And I read through the thing, and I got very close to... <laughs> it was like, yeah, that'll come back and bite me. So I just buttoned my lip. But, you know, we, we want great leaders, we expect great leaders, um, and then we're uh, somehow surprised that they have flaws. Think about it this way. Do you think that the leaders in the church at Thessalonica that Paul was writing about were perfect? No, they were, they were like us. They were finding their way. They had personalities, sometimes personality quirks. And Paul still wrote about them like this. We have to take that to our own view of leadership and, and, and think that through. All of the leaders that were, are referred to the, in the epistles are not unlike the leaders we deal with today. Yeah. So Paul, having, understanding that, maybe putting that our context in that, um, Paul gives us three characteristics for recognizing the leaders. Okay? And it's not good-looking, smart, and funny. So I've got one of those three. Sometimes I'm funny. I used to be good looking. I, I think I'm smart, but some of you know better. No, it's, it's three things. First, first here, he says, when he speaks to the leaders, he says, those who diligently labor among you. And what we mean by that is that we should expect leaders to work hard and work faithfully. Now, does that mean everything they do is perfect or right? Of course not. But when we see someone laboring at the work of the Lord, we, we recognize them that God's given them something. They stay at it. You know, have, you ever, have you ever had somebody uh, leading something and you realize they, it's what's well, like a part-time job to them? You know, they, they do it and it's like, well, I don't really need, you know, like you treat a part-time job, I don't really need this money. And so if the, the situation's no good, you say, well, I'm quitting that. I can go find a part-time job anywhere for a little extra cash, right? We don't want, we, we're not talking about those kind of leaders. We're not talking about somebody who's like, well, I'm doing you all a favor being a group leader or a task leader or something like that. We're talking about somebody who doesn't consider it a hobby, but knows that God has called them to serve the church this way, to give of their life this way. And we see that, and we recognize it, and we say, look at they are diligently laboring among us. Secondly, he says we should recognize that they are over us in the Lord, or they have a leadership over us in the Lord. 
It, it depends on which version you read, whether they add that word leadership. And, and that means they've been given, in some way, charge of your souls. When we see leaders in the church, what we're saying is, these are people who've taken the Lord's call on their life and said they will deliberately care about other people's well-being. Now, we're all supposed to care about each other's well-being, but these are people who said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give at least part of my life to that on a regular, I'm going to diligently labor at looking out for the well-being of their souls. In Hebrews, it says we should obey our leaders because, because they watch over our souls. And part of this is difficult because for us because we're so individual, you know? Some of us could read who are over you and Lord say, oh, nobody's over me, it's just me and Jesus. But it's not you and Jesus. That's not how Jesus planned it. Jesus planned it that there would be leaders in the church. He anointed his apostles and he told them to go and build, make disciples and plant churches. They've been given charge of over your souls. You need to believe that. Leaders need to believe that. I can't just think, well, this person's difficult, so too bad. No, if God's given them to me to be as part of my church, then I need to care about their well-being, especially their spiritual well-being. I have a certain charge over their soul. Now, if they won't recognize that, if they say, well, nobody's telling me what to do, well, then, you know, I'll tell them, well, We'll see what we can do about that, you know. And he goes on to, to further unpack what leaders do. And he says is they, they give you instruction. Uh, I think the ESV and the older New American Standard says they admonish you. Um, they, they bring you to face-to-face -to -face with the truth is what they do. Um, that's what leaders should do is help you see the truth and bring you to it. That's, that's true instruction, isn't it? If I'm trying to put something together, and, you know, I think, oh, I don't need the instructions, right? And I, which, of course, I don't. And, and, uh, and I go to put it together, and I'm realizing, well, I don't think the leg's supposed to come out this way. I open the instructions, and the instructions show me the right way. And that's what leadership should do to us remind us and show us and point us to the right way, the way to live and the way to serve the Lord. And then finally, he says about them, he says this about them. He says that you regard them very highly in love because of your work. Now, personally, it's the love part I like about this. You know, I'm glad that you're called to love me because I don't know that I do everything right. Well, I know I don't do everything right. Let's be honest about it. And it's not my place to foster esteem for myself. It's the Holy Spirit's job to be, us be reminded. So when we read this, when I read this, I think, about, I think about my pastor. And I think about, do I appreciate, do I acknowledge his role in my life? Do I acknowledge and esteem the value of, of how hard he works? to help me, to encourage me, to, to give me instruction, to point me at the truth. That's what I do. And when I do that, I think I need to show him the love that, that he's given to me. I need to, I need to regard him very highly in love because of his work. And that's what each of us should do toward our leadership. You know, I need your love. All leaders need your love. Because leadership, then and now, is a great challenge. So Paul says this, this is his first unpacking this, this exhortation. And I, I'm trying not to jump ahead. And then he, then he moves over, um, reinforcing this whole idea of the whole church. And, and I'm calling this next uh, verse, verse 14, I'm calling it family matter. So Leadership is part of the family, and now here's some family matters. So he starts off the next verse, he says this, we urge you, brothers and sisters. So remember that, because the next things he's going to say isn't for leaders, it's for all of us. It's for all of us. These are family matters. What he said to us about leaders as family, 
And what he says to us in this continued exhortation is family. He says, we urge you, uh, and he gives them uh, four charges to do as a church. And, and let me, I can't say this too much. This is not, to, these the next four charges are not for leaders alone. It's for all of us. You know, it's for all of us. He says, he says four things. He says, first, he says, admonish the unruly. Admonish the unruly. Now, first of all, we have to know what unruly is, right? You know, what, what is unruly? Is it somebody making, you know, noise in the back of the room? Well, that could be. But the word in, in, in some translations is, is translated idle. Um, or, or, or in other places, the idea is disorderly, like a soldier who's not obeying orders and not in line with his column and that sort of thing. Uh, one, di uh, one Bible dictionary says disorder, disorderly, undisciplined, without law and order. It means to set one side outside the order or to evade obligations or to act without discipline or to act irresponsibly. And now we know that in 2 uh, Thessalonians that Paul says, if there's people among you that won't work, they're just wasting their time, they're idling along, he says, you know, if they won't work, they don't eat. You know? So there's been this whole idea in talking to them about being diligent, being laboring with your hands, doing what you need to do. And when somebody's not doing what they need to do, whether it's taking care of their own lives or their own family, or, or ignoring what the Lord's told us and how we ought to live, they're unruly. You know? So if, if we say as a church, this is what we're going to do, and somebody just constantly fights it, they're unruly. You know? Not that we, we can't have... Um, questions or, or, or uh, variations of things we do, but we need to work together, you know. How many of you have ever taken a, fa a family car trip, okay? And you're trying to get everybody in the car, everybody working together, did everybody go to the bathroom, did everybody do this? And it's like if you got one kid that won't cooperate or one parent that won't cooperate, whichever it is, um, that person needs to get with it, right? They're out of the, the order is that we all get in the car, we've all gone to the bathroom, and we're all gonna be nice to each other while we're stuck inside this moving can. And, and so anybody that disrupts that is unruly. They're unruly. And they need to be admonished. They need to be brought back in to understand what we're doing. And I think I've said this uh, recently in another sermon I was doing is that, when we think of admonish, we think of scolding. We like, but that's not the word. The, the admonish, uh, perhaps it could have a, some con connotation to that. It, it, it's also translated, give you instruction. In fact, the word he said, he said, the leaders who give you instruction, and here we're supposed to admonish the unruly, that's the same Greek word. Same Greek word, to give instruction to, to admonish. Um, it means to instruct or give instruction. It might mean to remind or correct. It's translated warn in other times. Now think of, the, think of the road trip with your kids there. If I have to stop this car, if I have to pull over, we're warning them. To admonish someone is to impart understanding to them, to, to, to set them right, to put on their heart what needs to be. Um, See, each of us, not just the pastors, not just pastoral leaders or this leader or that, each of us should desire that every brother and sister that we have relationship with would walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which they've been called. And so some, when someone deviates from that, when, when you find out your friend who calls himself a believer is cheating on their taxes, they're not walking in a manner worthy. If that comes out, they bring dishonor to the name of Jesus. And so it's your job to call the office and tell and leave a message for the pastor. <laughs> no. It's not your job to leave a message. For, it's your job, because you found out about it, to admonish them. To say, brother, sister, this isn't right. 
This is the right way. You need to believe God for your finances and not have to lean on your own devices to make ends meet. If you think, oh, if I pay my taxes here, I'll get ripped off by the government. Well, maybe you are, but you've been called to pay your taxes. Don't ev- you can avoid taxes, get a good CPA, but don't evade taxes. Then you need a good lawyer. Yeah. We're called to walk in a manner worthy, and we're exhorted to exhort one another. Years ago, I was a, a, a home group leader in, in Oceanport, in Community Gospel Church. I had about 10 or 12 people in my home group, and one of the members of the group was a single mom who's, whose life was just in many ways, chaotic. Uh, she is a great sister, still is a great sister. Um, but, um, you know, she was, if you had a pecking order in, the, in, in this home group, she was down, she wasn't at the top, let's put it that way. And um, one day, she was over, and Yvonne ran out for something, and, and she said, Tony, can I talk to you about something? I said, oh, okay, Sure. She said, you know, last week, blah, 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 and she's telling me that. And she brings back an incident where she and I and Yvonne were together. And she said, when you talk to Yvonne like that, it just, it, it, it wasn't right. And she just, she just began, she, she's very humble, she's very respectful to me as her uh, leader, but she knew in her heart the way I had spoken to Yvonne dishonored Yvonne. I talked down to her, I was short with her. And she said, it just doesn't seem right to me that you do that. And I was, I was cut to the quick. And I asked her to forgive me. Then when Yvonne came home, I asked Yvonne to forgive me. You remember that, right? <laughs> and, and I got it right. And see, what that person did was they admonished me. In love, they admonished me. She, they didn't, she didn't call the office to find out if Ray was in so she could tell Ray what I had done so Ray could pull me aside and say, Tony, I heard that you talk to your wife this way. That's wrong. As a sister in the Lord, she admonished me because she loved me and she cared about my well-being. This is what Paul is saying to the Thessalonians. All of you, brothers and sisters, admonish the unruly. Speak up. Help one another walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. He goes on there from there and he says, encourage the faint-hearted. In other words, we could say comfort the, the discouraged. You know? And you know, in our world, there's just so much to get discouraged. Of, you know? Every time you go on Facebook, you see your friends have perfect lives, don't they? You know? I always kid Pastor uh, Chris when I, I say, well, I was looking at your Facebook, man. Your church is like perfect. And he's like, ooh, you know, we, we laugh at that. Because, of course, you, put, you always put your best foot forward there, right? But when we, we live in a world where we, all of this stuff is around us and we get discouraged over stuff that really doesn't matter, that at the end of the day, it has no value to us. Here we're talking about people that have been discouraged in their following of Jesus. This church is trying to follow Jesus. People are dragging them out of their homes, accusing them of of sedition against the the emperor because they follow a king that's not Caesar. They're being accused of these kind of things. Perhaps their family members. Some of you have experienced that. Where your family members, you become a Christian, your family members think, think you've gone off the deep end, that you're in a cult or something because you really want to follow Jesus. And many of the Thessalonians face this kind of opposition. And you know, when you face opposition for your faith, it really can discourage your heart. You're trying to do right. You're trying to do what the Lord's calling you to do. And you're being opposed for for the right thing. And so, We need to take that and look at our own lives and say, what are we discouraged about? Now, I I understand discouragement pretty well um, because I've experienced it a few times. But sometimes I'm discouraged over stuff that I shouldn't even be discouraged about because it just doesn't matter. But I've let it matter. We live in a world where the trivial is so exalted, is so important to us, 
that we can't see what the big things and the important things are. And so we get discouraged for things that shouldn't discourage us, but we also get discouraged for important things. Trauma in our lives, difficult things that happen in our lives discourage us. And when we are discouraged, our brothers and sisters are called on to encourage, comfort, and console us in that. And when you see someone who's discouraged, you should go and encourage them. And then finally, of, the, of these three, he says, help the weak. Sometimes we are just weak. Trauma, losses in our lives weaken us spiritually. We don't understand why these things are happening, things out of our control. And we need help. We need help in those difficult times. Now, for us, one of the, one of the challenges is that we don't know how to ask for help, or we're, we're reluctant to ask for help. And so we sit in a place of weakness when we don't need to. We should speak up. But here the, the exhortation is that you and I ought to be aware of our brothers and sisters, and when we see them in a place of weakness, we should step up and help them. I could name without, I won't name names, but there's been some situations in the church in the last six months where some of you have done just stellar jobs at helping those in very difficult circumstances. Things that were, they did not bring upon themselves, but weakened them and their family, and you stepped up and helped them. We should, we should do that too. And maybe while you're doing it, you can call the office, but and we'll help you help them. But remember, this is all of our job. Each one of us is called to do that. And then finally, he says to them, be patient with everyone. Perhaps this is the final exhortation in this, is because we need to be patient, because we, if, you, if you're not patient, you're usually not wise. Wisdom comes with patience. Wisdom comes from, rather than reacting, to really wait on God and say, what's happening here, Lord? We need wisdom to discern unruliness from faith, uh, faint-heartedness from weakness. You know, Some people will say they're weak or faint-hearted, but really they're unruly. Other people appear unruly, but really it's their faint-heartedness just out of control. Perhaps this is his final exhortation because Paul understood human nature. He understood that sometimes we don't want to wait for other people. When they're not working with us the way we think they ought to, when they're faint-hearted and not stepping up, when they're, when they're weak and they're taking from us, sometimes it's very tempting to just lose patience with them. But we're called as a spiritual family to go somewhere together. And to do that, we need patience with one another. You know? If, if, if you know what family is, you know you need patience because that's what we're called to do. And so it really, this is us. This is us. We have leadership, we have family matters, and we need to walk in them together. I'll give you a couple of closing thoughts about this. If you know, if you've been through our membership course, our membership course uh, 102, which is part of becoming a member of the church, is called Together on Our Journey of Faith. And we call it that because we're trying to reinforce this picture that as a church, yes, we have a corporation. Yes, we have structure this way and that way. But first and foremost, we are a spiritual family. We're a spiritual family called to do the work of the Lord together. And we want to journey together. And, and when one of us is weak or faint-hearted, we'll slow down and help them get in there. When your kid has a meltdown in the car, when you're going on the journey, screaming at them usually doesn't fix it, does it? No, usually it's calming them down, encouraging, we'll be okay, we'll get there. We, we, we come in love to them, patience with them, and get them, bring them to a place of cooperation so that we can go there. You see, a spiritual family is not built on performance. It's built on relationship. And Paul is talking to a spiritual family here. 
and he's talking to us. In a family, everyone finds their roles, discovers their gifts, and everyone is concerned for everyone else's well-being. And finally, so that we don't think that, you know, I think sometimes when we look at the scripture, we read, we read portions of scripture and it's all about God. Because, of course, the scripture is there to reveal Jesus to us. But then other times we read passages like this and we think, okay, now it's all up to us, you know. But, but it's not. What, what Paul's saying here isn't in a vacuum. It's in the presence of God. It's in the power of the Holy Spirit. What Paul's saying here isn't so much of, remember, this is what you should do, though he is saying those things. What he's saying is, this is who we are because of God. This is who we are because of the blood of Jesus. This is who we are because of the power of the Holy Spirit that was poured out for all of you. And so this is who you are. So because of who you are, this is how we should live. This is how we should treat one another. This is how we should admonish, encourage, and help one another. The one who has called us to this family is the one who has set us free from our sin who has healed us and is continuing to heal us. And we are singing that this morning. I'm rather like, yeah, yeah, I, I, he's forgiven all my sin. Yeah, it's so good. So let us, let us be admonished, encouraged, and helped by the scripture. And let us do that for one another. Amen? Now let's stand together. Father, we do pray this morning, Lord, that, that we would grasp these, these calls on our lives, Lord, this, this call to be a family, this call to care for one another, this call to look out for one another's well-being, Lord, and to uh, walk together in love, Lord, to stand together in your truth, Lord. We pray that you would help us to do that, Lord. Help each of us to, to see our role to use our gifts, Lord, and to, uh, to be diligent to serve one another as, as we serve you, Lord. I pray, Lord, Lord as, as we close, as the prayer partners come up here, Lord, that any of us who struggle with any of these things would come and, and, and ask for prayer, Lord. Or anything we need healing in, Lord, whether physically or spiritually, Lord, that you, we would pray for one another and, and we would be healed of these things, Lord. Because your work in us is far from done, Lord. Your sanctification, that powerful work of your spirit, continues each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you today.